Welcome back, everyone, to the Automotive Market Minute, in which may or may not take just over a minute. My name is Steven Georgiella. My name is Philip Trebatowski. And I'm James Sivko. We are going to roll right into it today. Okay, we're going to talk about the last month in review, the performance, inventory, sales, interest rates. And how about the fact that coming into election season, we have some of the most interesting data that we have seen in my time in the automotive space. And I have two geniuses, and yes, I said geniuses, on the call with me today, which are going to do a much better, who are going to do a much better job at unpacking this information. So very much looking forward to it. I am not going to waste time. We're going to jump right into the dealerships data for the month of August. Okay, so... As I mentioned last month, the thing that has been most shocking for me, and I'm just learning here, of course, I have James who has, I think, something like 65 years of experience to be able to help me with this, but I've never seen the lack of parity like I'm seeing right now, right? We're seeing these certain markets over here that are down 40%, and then we look over here, and these guys are, or and I should say less about the market specifically, more about specific dealerships that are just going to the moon and other dealers that are sinking very quickly. Myself, I think Phil as well, we haven't witnessed it like this in our, you know, in our 10 years of, of work in the automotive space. So you see, uh, you see year over year here is really what I want to focus on. Massive traffic uptick, leads overall year over year were fairly flat, though a better August than you saw uh, in July. You saw appointments up year over year about 30%, but up month over month, 8%. New sales were up and then, hmm used sales were actually down month over month, which is not something we've been seeing over the last six months. But how about the fact that little tidbit here, and then I'll let the statisticians take over. But how about the fact that through the beginning of September so far, so this is up to the 11th when this is being recorded, it'll be released in a couple of days here. How about the fact that when we look at new car demand, when it comes down to search, we're seeing new cars be about flat month over month, maybe even up a hair but we are seeing a dip in used car search terms. People are not nearly as excited or jazzed about used cars in the month of September so far, but that's a totally different subject. Mr. Phil and Mr. James, please take it away. Well, let's look at inventory from a national perspective, and you can see that supply has tightened for both new and used really over the last four to eight weeks or so. Um, new day supply, uh, that is relatively flat against the, against the previous month. But as of right now, new day supply has declined about 7% over the most recent week. And it's now at the lowest level of the entire year. So all of 2024, new inventory is currently at its lowest levels. It's actually true for used as well. Uh, used inventory was essentially flat against the latest week. And it is now down about 2%. Uh, compared to 2023. But speaking of used, not only is search volume down, used inventory as a whole is down as well as new. And if I saw correctly there, Phil, we are now below 2023 and we're dipping below 2021. Correct. We're very close, almost dipping below. I mean, we're pretty much at a cross, uh, a cross section between 2020, 2021, and now 2024. Looking at vehicle sales this is why inventory has been dropping sales have picked up uh again overall very strong august you can see new retail sales in august those have jumped up after the cdk shortage new retail sales posted a very very strong august uh, likewise use retail sales if this is uh in part due to the cdk outage but we have seen new and used retail sales really start to pick up uh, throughout the last four weeks or so. But now that we are actually into September, will that momentum stay or will that momentum ultimately dissipate as we head into the fall months? And it's interesting too, when I go back to some of the articles I saw at the end of Q1, talking about the second half of the year slowing down in new car sales. I don't think that would that would surprise anybody, but it's interesting. It's like we almost forgot that we said that, and now all of a sudden factories are making less vehicles. I believe they're making less EVs more than anything, but they're making less vehicles, and we're kind of sitting there going, oh, we're selling less new vehicles. Phil, I'm going to speak more directly on taking the emotions of the dealers, right, taking those phone calls. Uh, a lot more phone calls about, hey, my new sales are drying up. It's not been as much of this. And this is from also new prospects as well. Everybody kind of feeling that. And it's like, well, didn't we just four or five months ago say the fact that we knew that things were going to slow down in the second half of the year? And the factories mirrored 
that estimate by making less cars. So it's like, we just forgot. We forgot what we said. That we did. Automotive market moves fast. Here's how low APR financing looks. You can see all vehicles that have a less than 3% or a 0% APR offer on it currently. As of right now, the proportion of vehicles that have a less than 3% APR rate on them rose up to 12.1% in August. We touched on this in previous months. Factories have not been uh, very forthcoming with incentives. We did see that move up a hair in August. We'll see how September looks. Um, I would anticipate really that these may start to regress a bit. And I wanted to also, looking at the average auto loan rates, overall, you can see the new average auto loan rate, used average auto loan rate. Really, these have been kind of steadily grinding higher throughout much of this year. They've been pretty consistent. With the Fed talking about cutting rates, will we expect to start to see these start to decline and ultimately see lower rates? Uh, we may start to see that as early as about a week or so when the Fed meets. Uh, Simon, so anything to add there? Yeah, I have one thing I'd like to say. I'd like to put myself out there here. I've done it once already. I'm going to do it one more time. I believe that going into the end of Q4, that all of a sudden the factories are going to blow out when it comes down to interest rates, offers, et cetera. I believe that, I believe that December is going to be a December to remember. Do I have December to remember patented or trademarked in any way? Absolutely not. But with that said, I can say it might be a December to remember. All right. So just keep that in mind. And, and with that, I'm going to also make a little prediction here. I believe that in order to have a December to remember, factories are really going to need to be the catalyst for that. I think that with where the Fed is at, we're likely to see a 25 bips cut uh, coming up here in about a week. But then after that, who really knows what's going to happen? I think if these factories want to provide support to the consumer, they're going to need to do it. They're not going to be able to rely on the Fed to ultimately improve that demand from a pricing and rate standpoint. And as we go to slide nine here, my question is, is can we get an economist up in here? Can we get an economist up in here? Go ahead. Yes, we can. This is a, a chart that we have shown you a few times uh, over the market minute. And that is a uh, consumer sentiment survey here in orange and vehicle sales in black. Uh, vehicle sales are each month at a seasonally adjusted annual rate. And this is data that goes back decades here to give you some perspective. The reason why we're bringing this chart back is because we've had some bad prints recently. So zooming in on recent action in consumer sentiment, it's really pointing towards potentially weaker sales over the next few months as the auto sales, this is in units, needs to either catch down to consumer sentiment in our eye or consumer sentiment may just turn up here as you know, maybe consumers as we get through the election, maybe their confidence in vehicle buying conditions and, and overall spending potential turns back up again. What I think is interesting that I've learned from James here is eventually if they keep on separating, there must be a catalyst, there must be an event in which then makes them flip and normalize. And as we're watching this, you see, and again, I love the fact that the data team here and the, and the branding team as well, broke it out like this and zoomed it in, it's separating. And it's separating more and more and more. And that is a cause for concern because of history and when, what's happened historically. Go ahead next, sir, Phil. And, and Steve, you've talked about parity quite a, quite a great length over the last couple of weeks. I think this is a really good slide that really captures the discrepancy and parity that we've been seeing. As the consumer, they've now, for five months in a row, consumer sentiment has fallen, <laughs> fallen, fallen, while overall, unit volume has kind of just bounced up and down. But where this goes in the future, that's going to be very interesting to watch and to follow. So a big part of the consumer sentiment survey is car buying intentions. Uh, we've shown this concept to you a few different ways over the last couple of months, but I think we've landed on the way we're gonna to choose to pre pre present this through the future. And this is a simple question on the survey. Are you buying a car in the next six months? The answer is yes or no or uncertain. So the way we're presenting this now to simplify things is simply yes minus no plus 100. 
it gives us a really handy way to assess whether we have a net tight market in terms of consumers or a net loose one. And, um, you know, with 100 kind of at the middle, and this is data that goes all the way back to 1978, which is a lifetime in the car business, it is a big input into the survey on the prior page. And you can see over on the right, we've had three bad data points in a row. So less and less consumers are making six-month plans to buy a car. Now, James, why would that be? Well, thanks, Phil. That's a great question. Um, There is detail inside the survey. I know that all of you hear these complaints every single day, but this is useful data in terms of what consumers are complaining about, why they can't buy right now, or why they're not planning to buy right now. And we've got some news in, in here. The good news first is the personal situation of I can't afford it, which is the third bar here, has gone down quite a bit. And also supply in terms of, hey, they don't have this in my color or whatever, and selection and inventory, that's gone down. And then also consumers are finally getting used to prices. So uh, slowly but surely, price level is going to get accepted by consumers. So that's gone down. But really, the new constraint that consumers are facing is interest rates and credit tightness, you know, be that down payment requirements, et cetera, that's rising. So right now, if you look at the top two complaints, it's all math. It's all what's the price? Where can I finance it? How much do I have to put down? What do the payments look like? What interest rate is floating around out there? That's the state of the consumer market right now when they walk in the door. This is an interesting chart. This is um, the average rate for small businesses. This is a real rate. So this is the interest rate minus inflation for small businesses. And really, this is useful to you as a dealer two ways. One, this is what your pickup truck buyers and, and your Sprinter van buyer is dealing with every day in their business. So one, when you trot out a a wider interest rate for them, they're kind of used to it because they're seeing it everywhere. But two, this has been a real pain for them to deal with. And we're at levels, this is, again, the interest rate minus inflation, we're at levels where we were at the beginning of the 08 financial crisis. So the small business owner is kind of squealing about credit conditions and about the interest rates that they have to pay everywhere. And it's affecting their business decision making. Yep. Now, James, uh, actually a couple of fun facts here. Right now, August of 24 and September of 07 are highlighted here. Well, just a couple of fun facts. On September 18th in 2007, that was the same day that the Fed first cut, cut rates starting in 2007. Next week, the Fed will likely cut rates for the first time this cycle, also on September 18th. And as you can see that these charts are very similar. Well, if we broaden that to, for example, the S&P 500, in 2007, the S&P made a summer high on July 16th. And in 2024, the S&P also made a summer high on July 16th of this current year. So it is absolutely absurd how similar this year is compared to 2007. We didn't do it. It's not us. We are reporters, okay? We are reporters. One of us is an economist. The rest are reporters. Carry on. This is an interesting chart. This is the National Federation of Independent Businesses. This is essentially the bottom half of business size in the U.S. And this is their index of loan availability in black and next to the inverse of jobless claims. So we've taken the jobless claim series and we flipped it over. And- What we've got here is we're starting to see labor market weakness and banks are going to react like they always do with the small businesses. And there's a possible loan tightening going on. So we're watching this graph very closely because small businesses are probably the most important part of the economy in terms of growth. I I think that this is a really good example of, of there not being current parity throughout the market. And you can see that disconnect that really hasn't hasn't occurred that much dating all the way back to 1986. But now you can see uh, as small business loan availability has started to fall, jobless claims have not. And so again, it, we're under the assumption that there's going to be 
more parity in the coming months, and these graphs should start to align a bit more. All right, closing rant coming in hot here. So I'd like to first and foremost be very clear. Compared to the two gentlemen that I uh, share the stage with on this call, I'm always less educated on the matter than they are. But with that said, I'm quite good at reading a billboard or four. So with that said, based on the evidence that I have my disposal, what I told these guys months and months and months ago is, is I don't understand the simple math of all this. That's where I come from. I'm just a conservative Midwesterner that does back of envelope. Okay, that's it. What I don't understand is we continue to see all this excitement, these victory laps after we're getting these, quote, Friday morning meetings, these job reports. And then what happens is in some way, shape or form, we can come back the next month and we can make these adjustments and somehow say that there's 818,000 fewer jobs, not 10,000, not 100,000, nearly a million fewer jobs. And it's just like, huh. And it's like the massive, massive influx of positive news when it comes out. But then when it's adjusted, it's done quietly. And I don't understand that because at the end of the day, I feel like if you do something really positive, then it's weighted that way. And if you do something negative, it should be weighted the same way, but it's not. And so I sit here and I go, how can we pound our chests over and over and over about all the great stuff? But then when the bad stuff happens, there's a fucking whisper in the back room. And it's like, yeah, but nobody actually heard about it. So then you just stay on this bull run and everything just keeps on going. So my rant at the end of all this is, is I hear from you two. You guys give me great resources. I look into it again, not nearly to the degree that you guys do, but I just look at the economics of this business, the other businesses I run. And I look and I'm like, this doesn't make sense. But then when you look at the information you guys presented today about where things are at, Phil, amazing information with regards to now versus 07 or the previous uh, true recession, the great recession, I look at it and I go, well, when it was the zero hedge called out, whatever, four weeks ago that, hey, we're probably on another 90 to 120 day run. It seems that that's the case after we tested that resistance level about three, four weeks ago. And it's like, this stuff right here tells you that it's eventually going to come to an end, yet for some reason, we just won't talk about it. We, not we, them, they. Um, we will talk about it. We do, we, these, are. James, do you have something to say? We are talking about it. You know, the, uh, the fact that these stats are broadcast far and wide on television uh, once a month on Fridays has probably created a culture and an incentive in the government to try to beat expectations like it's uh, some kind of a stocks earnings report. And for those of us out here in the economy, trying to sell cars and, and trying to make decisions and trying to stock inventory, this isn't helpful. When the bias on these numbers is the same way every month and for eight or nine straight months in a row, we get beats of expectations and everything from stock prices to inventory levels um, are being affected by this. And then the rug gets pulled out at the end. Like, this is what causes recessions, is bad allocation of capital. And um, although the Department of Labor here thinks they're doing us a favor, they're not, and they need to stop. I'm going to use this analogy because I want to make sure that you know, I describe it the way that I see it. And here's what it is, Okay. Congratulations, you're eating a fantastic breakfast, a fantastic lunch, and a fantastic dinner. Okay, you got some chicken, you got some broccoli, you got some rice. The whole family's watching you. The problem is, is when all the cameras and the lights go down, you're sitting in bed and you ate three entire rows of Oreos. So the reason why you're fat is not because of your DNA. The reason why you're fat is because you're sitting there eating Oreos and nobody knows about it. And I feel like the economy, the people that are leading the economy and are reporting, they're sitting there telling you how good they're eating, yet... When everything goes down and the lights are off, they're sitting there eating rows and rows of Oreos and not telling you about it. And by the way, you're going to pay for it at the end of the day, right? There's no Ozempic for the entire U.S. economy. And that's my rant to finish here. Gentlemen, did you have anything else on top of that? I expect that we will see more and more parity in the coming months. What that looks like, we'll just have to wait and find out. On behalf of my esteemed colleagues, James and Phil Trebitowski, my name is Steven Gergella, and God willing, we will see you again in one hell of an episode of the Automotive Market Minute. See you later.